welcome to Board Game Breakfast, your weekly dose of board gaming news and all sorts of other stuff about board games. This is the first one of November 2014. We're almost a year in. Thanks so much for watching. And I'd like to remind you all about the Jack Vass Memorial Fund auction, which has plenty of items that you can go in and bid on to help the Jack Vass Memorial Fund, uh, a fund that helps gamers in their time of need. And you can also um, put things up for auction. We just added a new item there. Uh, which is on page 31, I believe, or 30 or 31, uh, in which you can come down and have a day of gaming with the Dice Tower guys here in Miami. Not only with us, but with Rich Sommer, uh, who's best known for being Harry Crane on Mad Men. So we'll have a great time. I'll give snacks. We'll, and we'll play a game that you like to play. So you go in there and auction or bid for that, and the money all goes to the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund. Okay, well, lots of other things going on, but we need to get to the news. Most of the news this week is Kickstarter news, really, but we'll, we'll let Nick take care of that in a second. Uh, but there's a lot of games that are coming out soon. Lagoon, Land of Druids, I wasn't very fond of the game, but obviously a lot of people are. That will be in stores soon, as is Dungeon Dwellers, which I'll be reviewing in a few weeks or so. Uh, the, you want to know how to play Memoir 44? Well, there's a book now out that will tell you how to play it best. And finally, Dice Masters and Dungeons and & Dragons Attack Wing are in stores, or at least the Uncanny X-Men set of Dice Masters, and it seems like there's plenty out there, so hopefully the supply issues are over, go out and really, it's a fantastic game. Toy Vault has announced Tall Card, which is a game from inside the Firefly universe, which they will be producing, and you know, reading over the description of this, I'm not, I'm a little worried about this. Toy Vault has kind of a spotty record of games anyway, but there, this one it sounds like they're like, well, you can make up your own rules and there's all kinds of things and you can do it yourself and design your own game. Well, I would hope that you would actually provide a game in a box. Maybe they will. And from Asmodee, very soon you will see the, uh, the Babel expansion for Seven Wonders and Colt Express, which is a fantastic game, and I'll be reviewing that in a couple weeks also. And then in other news, which is not news because it's so not surprising, AEG has announced another love letter, Batman love letter. <laughs> I really tried hard not to, to use the phrase jump the shark with these guys, but Batman love letter. See, it's kind of weird because, yes, I know love letter is a great little game, and Batman is a great IP. And Batman, with the mechanisms of Love Letter, might work. But calling it Batman Love Letter just sounds odd. But, hey, what do I know? In this segment, I tell you what's on my shelf and why I keep it here. I'm actually doing two shelves here because this shelf here mostly has a bunch of plastic containers, which has some stuff for Small World. And uh, let's see, I got some Hero Click stuff, and then I got some Cross Master stuff here, and then some extra cards for Dice Masters. So, but we're looking here at the board games. Pompeii is a great little game. I like the, the new box size of the new Mayfair version uh, about, you know, trying to escape a volcano that's rushing and destroying a town. Uh, I guess this is self-serving. I have my own copy of Nothing Personal, but I, I do like my own game. I won't put it on any top 10 list or any on top 100 list, but it would be in my top 100. I do enjoy it. Uh, go figure. Cube Quest is a really fun uh, two-player game cube game where you're flicking cubes at each other and they have different powers and you build different structures. Really cool little game. My kids like it a lot. Sheriff of Nottingham, obviously I love that. That's why it's part of the Dice Tower Essentials line. Uh, Warhammer Disc Wars. I think this is actually an excellent little combat game and I'm looking forward to seeing the expansions. Plucking Pairs, a party game, but a party game that I pull out quite often uh, where you turn over different uh, sets of cards and then you compare, uh, you have to put them all in pairs and then you're hoping that the pairs you put them in match pairs other people did. And then Quarriers, Quarterfacts, this is actually everything from Quarriers is in one box. I was able to manage to fit it all in one box and so I picked the Quarterfacts box because that was, I think, the new, one of the newest boxes and I was able to fit everything inside it. So some fun games here. Let's get back to Board Game Breakfast. Still don't know what 
what it means Played with cards that are red, yellow and green and purple Trains and factories all are Japanese All the fishes that white men build the city of your dreams Cafes, bakeries all are Japanese Watch you call if you please Build the city of your dreams Machi I'm Tom Vessel. Jason Levine. And today we have a question from Jonathan who says, what do you do when you're playing a game with someone and you find out that they loathe it, that they hate it, and they're pretty vocal about it, and do you quit the game or do you say, hey, we started this, we're finishing it? He said he played a game of nations with somebody and they hated it, and they really were like, oh, I don't like this game, and it kind of ruined the experience for everybody else. Well, usually... I mean, I love playing games to the end, and even if I'm getting killed in the game, I'll be like, we gotta play it out, we gotta play it out. But if someone at the table really, really, really doesn't want to play a game and says, this is awful, why do we have to play this for another two hours if it was a long game, and everyone else wanted to pack it up, I would pack it up. In fact, we had that situation recently. I don't remember what the game was, but I remember everyone's like, are we really gonna go through this whole game? And I was, And everyone looked at me first, and I said, okay, if everyone wants to pack it up, we'll pack it up. I don't know what you're talking about. That doesn't happen recently. That happens all the time where we are like, wow, this game's really bad. But let's, let's take something, though, where everyone really does like the game. Let's say I bring out Cosmic Encounter, my favorite game. Yeah. And so I play it, and five of us are really enjoying it. But the sixth guy, you know, let's just call him Billy Bob. Okay, Billy Bob, Billy Bob he, hates, he hates the game. He despises it. And he's like really having a bad time. Do we say, you know what, we'll just play without you? Or do we break the game? I mean, what do you do in that situation? Well, if we hadn't already started the game, if Billy Bob was playing the game and was already in the game and everyone else was enjoying it, I'd say, you know, just stick it out um, and, you know, do your best. He might king make at that point. He might do things that are going to mess with the game, but I would say stick it out. Of course, if he said all this before and said, I don't want to play it, I don't want to play it, I don't want to play it, then I would say, let's pick something else to make everyone happy. Okay, I, I would do my best to give them an out. I think I would let them get out of the game if they don't like it. Uh, if it's early enough in the game, I'll say, you know what, why don't we stop playing this, we'll play something else, or maybe we'll just, we'll restart without you, you can go find something else. I really don't like to give people bad experiences in games. If someone doesn't like a game, I mean... Yeah, that's true, that's true. Why make them play it? The whole point of games is that fun, and if someone's having a terrible time. That being said, if you're having a terrible time playing a game, you don't necessarily need to make everyone else's life at the table miserable. Yes. And honestly, if you sit there and go, blah, blah, blah. now, there are times, and when we all hate a game, and we are just making fun of it, and talking about how terrible it is the entire game, right? And we'll keep playing it, we'll have a good laugh but about it. But we're all it. like, but when one person hates a game and no one else does, it's I've different. been in those games, and hopefully haven't been the bad guy, but been in a game where someone's like, oh, oh, oh. And you're just like, oh man, I can't wait till this is over because it really detracts from my fun yes. to see them hating the game it, so much. Especially, I, I've noticed in general, if someone hates the game, what they'll do is they'll, you know, oh, I'm in fifth place, so I'm going to attack the guy in fourth, just to take fourth. I'm not going to attack the leader because I don't care about who's winning. I'm right, well, that's like a, the guy in fourth. that's a whole different conversation. But. but but in general, like I know when I don't like a game, I'll stick it out. I always will stick out a game if I don't like it, if everyone else is having fun because we should at least finish it. Well, anyhow, that's it for today. If you guys have questions, you can always send them to us at dicetower at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. And Jason Levine. Today 
our component we're looking at is the Stonemeyer Games Treasure Chest. This was on Kickstarter, and I liked it enough that I actually backed it. I thought it was a pretty cool idea. Um, what it is is it's a box. It looks like a board game box. It's actually a pretty nice box, and I feel kind of bad about it because I don't plan on keeping it in the box. But it comes with different types of goods that can replace goods in your game. Now, these goods are kind of specifically oriented towards perhaps Viticulture and Euphoria, which are the other games from Stonemeyer Games, but they, they also work for plenty of other games. So here we have some rocks, and these actually feel like rocks, and I can't kind of convey that to you. And we're some stone here, or iron. I'm thinking about sticking either or both of these in my Caverna game to make that one better, or Stone Age. The wood here is really nice. It has a really good hefty weight feel to it. Looks like a log of wood. Um, this might be my favorite component, but my favorite is the, is the gold piece, the gold, the gold bars. These are heavy little metal bars. They have a nice shine to them. If you have any game with gold in, that is just amazing. The blue gems are probably my least excited thing about the box. I mean, I like them, but it's not like I'm hurting for gems. I have lots of different gems in games. The ones from Ascension, you always have extra ones from there. But these do look good, and they are more pointed like this. So they're, they're cool and a good addition. And then the bricks. And the bricks are really nice because they look like they're unfinished, not really well done bricks. And so they, they look kind of like bricks that you would actually be using to build something in a game. So you have all these and it comes in this nice uh, insert. But like I said, I'm going to be taking them out and putting them in various games. One of these here, so you get all these pieces to a certain number. There's 26 in the box of each of the different types, which is probably enough for most games, enough for me. And of course, you can buy multiple boxes if you want to stick them in the other games. This is great. I would love to see a treasure chest too with more pieces. But for now, this is one way to really trick out your games. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. Sentinels of the Multiverse has long been on my wish list for board game apps, and it recently released for tablets. Was it worth the wait? Let's take a quick look. In Sentinels of the Multiverse, players cooperate to defeat a big baddie through card battle. The enemy is powerful, and even though you outnumber him, victory is not guaranteed. The Sentinels of the Multiverse app is very faithful to the physical game, making some smart choices with screen real estate while still making it an immersive experience, such as using full art backgrounds and comic-like page turns. There's a decent rules overview section, but the tutorial will be needed if you're new to the game. Thankfully, it's thorough and entertaining. There are some nice in-game options, and I especially appreciate the ability to set the pace of play. The app also includes a multiverse compendium complete with character backgrounds and card index. In a crowd-pleasing move, Sentinels of the Multiverse released on iOS and Android at the same time. You can only play solo or pass and play, but really, to me, this game shines as a solo play experience. Of course, online play would be nice, but I don't feel jilted by not having it. I do wish we had the ability to have more than one game saved at a time. One of the common complaints about Sentinels of the Multiverse is the randomness and imbalance of the characters, and the app does nothing to change that. But if you already like Sentinels, the app is a no-brainer. For me, the app solves two problems. One, the fiddliness of the counters, which Sentinel's Psychic app helps with as well. And two, I have a hard time getting this game to the table. Now, the app is a sleek gaming experience, and the Sentinels of the Multiverse app will be a go-to solo play game for me from now on. Give it a try. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in the Dice Tower production this week, but the biggest is tomorrow at 9.30 EST. Um, there's going, we're going to do a live video hangout between me and Z Garcia and Eric Summer, where you will be able to watch us. We're going to just basically talk about Essen. Yeah, I know Essen was a couple weeks ago, but we're going to do kind of a detox and, and talk about the different things that we saw there. You'll have a chance to come and ask questions, a live of us. And if people run out of questions about Essen, we'll answer questions about all sorts of things. We've had a chance to play several of the games, which leads me into my next production uh, thing, which is more reviews. Last week, I put up 15 reviews. I'm going to try to do the same thing this week and guaranteeing that five of those 15 reviews are some pretty big names. So I'm very excited to talk about some of these. Not all 
them are positive, but there are some fantastic things. One in particular I'm really excited to talk about this week. Actually, more than one. But there's one that I did not think I would be a big fan of that I am. A very strong Euro game that came out at Essen. Um, so there is all that. And, of course, there's everything at Dice Tower Network. Uh, which you can find all the different podcasts that we do. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be producing the Dice Tower Show, where we talk about our top 10 one-hit wonders. Okay, well, let's go on. Howdy, partner. I'm Ian James, and welcome to Component Moments. I got a fresh pint of brew. Now I'm ready to show you some components. So let's get started. I'm talking about square shooters from Heartland. Cause nothing says Old West like a card and dice game from Cleveland, Ohio. Just like me. These are the nicest custom dice i ever seen around these parts. They're as big as King of Tokyo, but much nicer. It comes with nine custom dice. A lot of cards, a bunch of chips, and a bag to keep them all in. It's a great game for kids and adults, so I mean from Open Box Games Jr. So see you next time. Bye! Jazz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise with the next installment in this series on whether the board game industry is experiencing a bubble and what it could mean if it bursts. Last time we talked about an increase in the number of board game retailers and I pondered whether this was actually good for the long-term health of the industry. I think it depends on the cause of this increase. Is it due to a steady growing interest in the hobby spread through multiple demographics? Or is it just because board games are a current cultural fad? Fads often feed on a collectability mentality. Remember Beanie Babies? Or, returning to my previous point of comparison, the state of the comic book industry in the mid-90s, which was a zenith of funny books with frivolous frills in order to capture the purchasing power of the collector's market. One gimmick used by the comic book publishers was variant covers. For example, 1991's X-Men No. 1 had five different covers, but the contents of each of these issues was all the same. Another gimmick was utilizing crossovers. Maybe the crossover will be a gateway to introduce you, and your wallet, to the other one. And this can lead to some real, you got your chocolate in my peanut butter type of moments. Oh, on a completely unrelated note, Cryptozoic and AEG have recently announced that they've entered into a strategic partnership to release even more versions of the popular card game Love Letter, which will feature crossovers by characters from Adventure Time, DC Comics, and The Hobbit. Mmm, chocolatey. And finally, there was a flood of yearbooks and annuals which celebrated arbitrary milestones by wrapping recycled content within a fancy, overpriced new wrapper. I don't have any examples of this because I ironically spent all my time this week playing the 10th anniversary editions of Power Grid Deluxe and Ticket to Ride while waiting for my deluxe version of Takenoko to arrive. These gimmicky practices could lead to an artificially inflated, unsustainable market in danger of fatigue. What happens when that bubble bursts? We'll find out in our next installment, a special all hologram edition with a crossover by a limited edition collectible guest star. Or just me standing here talking. Notice that here at the Dice Tower, we publish a few reviews. Probably more than a few. Probably too many. That's what people say. But there are many folks who don't like the way we do it, which is no surprise because that's the way it is when you do any sort of content. Not everyone's going to like what you do. Uh, but I was reading a thread on Board Game Geek uh, the other day, which was says, "Why do video reviews include a summary of how the game plays?" And it turned into a written and video reviews. Why do they include how to play the game? And a very prominent um, blogger said this, because they suck, because people fundamentally misunderstand the review form and the purpose of writing one. Seriously, this is one of the most frustrating and depressing aspects of board game fandom. A review is a piece of critical work. It's 
it's there for you to express your feelings about a game, to take a stand and defend it, and to be thoughtful and entertaining. Nobody wants to read the sequence of play or hear you discuss the box insert. And this got a lot of uh, backing and a lot of people agreed and there were some big discussions basically about how reviews these days aren't, don't have enough critical behind them and how they have to format and so on and so forth. And I thought I'd talk a little bit about that. When I started writing reviews over 10 years ago, uh, my goal was just to tell people how fun some games were that I played. I played them, I had so much fun playing them and I thought, hey, when I'm looking to play a game, I went and read other people's reviews and I thought, well, then I'll, do, I'll, I'll try to help people out too. I'll tell people how much fun I had playing them. Now, I never claimed to be a good writer. I still don't claim to be a good writer at all. In fact, as soon as I could make the jump to video, I did because I always felt like I was a better talker than I was a writer. And even now on a forum post, you know, typing it out, I'd rather just say what I'm thinking. Um, <laughs> I know, I know, I know I'm not a good speaker either, but anyhow. Um, but I just wanted to put kind of my thoughts onto paper and now onto video about how I feel about a game. And I called those reviews, which uh, a lot of people say those are not reviews and they're impressions and all this sort of stuff. I don't really care that much about it. To me, I call it a review because people coming in know what they're expecting. I'm gonna be talking about a game. I'm gonna tell you if I like the game or not and I'm going to tell you why. Now, I've done this thing, you know, of course, where I come in and I say something to introduce the video, then I show you how the game is played, and then I explain why or I did or did not like the video at the, uh, the game at the end. And I do some other things. I have the component drop, and this past week we added in a new segment where I judge the game just so I can give you kind of a quick summation of what my thoughts were on the game. And that's how we do it. I stand in front of my wall of games because I thought that'd be a cool backdrop, and now, of course, Seems like all the video reviewers do it, so maybe I should find something else. Stand in front of a pile of game pieces or I don't know what. But I, I, I did the formula, and I used to, when I wrote my, my reviews, I always did a formula there for them also because it helped me. It helped me because I said, okay, this is a good way to organize my thoughts. This is how, if I was writing a paper, I would have done that when I learned to write, you know, learned to organize my thoughts in a very specific way. And so I do it that way so that if you want to see how the game is played, you can go watch that. If you want to skip it, you can skip ahead to just see my thoughts. Or if you don't want to see my thoughts and just see how the game is played, it's very easy to do. You don't have to kind of pull it together. And other reviewers have done similar things and other reviewers have done very different things. And so I understand that I'm not reaching any kind of high critical level on board games. I mean, I reach a, maybe a higher plane on the Miami Dice where me, Z, and Sam will go back and forth about games, sometimes on podcasts. But this leads into a personal preference for me as a reviewer. Uh, when I was a kid in high school, I read lots of books and I loved to read books. I loved to read. And I love to read heavy books and I love even more often to read light and I love to read fiction. For example, I love science fiction. So I read a lot of it. And when I was in high school, it was always very frustrating and annoying to me that I would read these things and have a great time reading it. And then the teacher would say, well, here's this deeper meaning behind it. And they would go into this big, long thing. And then they would make me write papers on that. And I understand the purpose for that. But to me, Gulliver's Travels, for example, was a fun story about a guy who went and to a place where all the people were small and then to a place where all the people were giants and not some political allegory. Yes, I know it's a political allegory and I understand that. And there is room for that critical talk. But for me personally, I just wanted to know, was the book fun to read? And that's all I ever really care about. And that's the same way it is with games. I don't really care about the deeper meanings and all that stuff behind games. I just want to know one thing. Is it fun? Now, there's other things that I'm also interested in, like does it teach valuable life lessons or good historical lessons to other people? And those are things. Or does it work well with kids? And so when I do a review, those are the things I point out. Why do I do the game run view? Because I, it's important, I think, to know how the game works. I want to show you how the game works. Maybe my opinion means nothing to you, and that's perfectly fine, but by me showing you the game, you can do it. In short, I do my reviews the way that I do them because that's what I would want to watch. I would want to see, how does the game play? Okay, what do you think about it? And then, passionately, what do you think about it? And that's what I try to put into my games is this passion, whether it's good or bad. And so when I read these things and I read a bunch of folks, you know, complaining about the fact that our things aren't more critical and there's not enough more critical writing about board games, I'm not actually opposed to what these people are saying. Um, 
There's maybe there should be more critical writing on board games, and critical thought on board games. But for me and for for myself at the Dice Tower, I mean, if someone else wants to come on Dice Tower and do more critiques of games on a more higher critical plane, I would be interested in that. But for me and what I'm going to do, I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to tell you whether the game's fun, whether you should have the game in your collection. And I think, despite the fact that you know nobody wants to watch it, I think our numbers back us up that some people are interested in that. So I just wanted to explain a little bit about why we do reviews the way we do them, because we are here for one purpose, one purpose only, to tell you that games are fun and to give you an idea of which of these games might be best for you. Even if I absolutely hate on a game, I hope that you might be able to see something good in it. Or if I love a game, oh, Imperial Assault, um, you might decide that that is not for you. And that is what we're doing. We're trying to promote board gaming in general and yes, we're probably not on high enough of a critical plane for many people, but for most of folks, I think, they just want to know, am I going to have fun? And hopefully we're here to tell you that. Okay, we have taken Whitleypedia on the road, as you can see. Because if you're anything like me, you wanted to spend Halloween with loved ones, Trico the Treating, and dressed up in costume. But if you do get together with loved ones this upcoming holiday season, chances are you will be responsible for providing entertainment at some point. So when everyone's bellies are full of Thanksgiving dinner or everyone's tired from a day of winter sports, what are you going to bust out on them? You will need something that can appeal to non-gamers, still appeal to gamers, is rules light, is fast but holds up to repeat play, and can be enjoyed equally by people of many different ages. The best option available for holiday gaming is Dixit. Dixit is a fast-paced party game where players take turns telling brief stories about cards in their hands, then vote on the stories for points. Dixit is a longtime favorite of many gamers. Its honors include the 2010 Spiel des Jahres. It's only ranked 108 on Board Game Geek, but it's number 22 on the Dice Tower People's Choice, and number 21 on the so-called Geek Voters list that we've talked about a couple times here already. Dixit is very easy to teach, but I'd recommend that you print out little cheat sheets to teach people how to score, because otherwise you will have to explain the scoring system over and over and over again until your throat is cracked and bloody. Recently, I purchased the Daydreams expansion from CoolStuffInc.com. And I'm looking forward to trying it out with family this Thanksgiving. I can't think of any place that I'd rather buy games than CoolStuffInc.com. Was it? Was that good? CoolStuffInc.com. What's happening, everybody? I'm John Zengline from ChalkboardGameReviews.com, and I'm continuing my segment of giving shout-outs to all the board game media creators out there. Today, I have to give a shout-out to Portal Games, not only because it shares the name with the greatest video game series of all time, but also because they make great games, but they do a lot to contribute to the board game community. You should check out the blog, BoardGamesThatTellStories.com, where the designer and publisher of Portal Games, Ignacy Trezacek, writes his thoughts, feelings, a lot about what's going on in board games. In his latest post, he writes about a book that he was creating while he was at Essenspiel. Remember video games from a long time ago when they were just super hard and you always had to have a cheat code to get through a boss fight, or you had to go buy a magazine that told you how to get through a level? He thought it would be a really neat idea if each designer wrote in the book one tip for their game. And so that book got passed around at Essenspiel. And now he has that book and he's donating it to charity. That's a really cool idea. I also recommend that you check out the Portal vlog on YouTube. He lets you know what's going on with Portal games, talks about maybe games that he's been playing, teaches you how to pronounce designer names that we here in the States probably have no idea to pronounce, like Mihal Orach. I never knew what the little L with the... Anyway, you should check that out. He also is really easy to get a hold of on Twitter. You can even hashtag AskTrezik and ask him a question, and he'll answer it in his next Portal vlog. How about... 
What type of beer should I drink when I play Narashima Hex? We'll see if he answers it. I highly recommend you give the Portal Vlog a subscribe or go to boardgamesatellstories.com and listen, listen, read the blog. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hey, folks, that's it for today. I'm so glad you came in. Don't forget, 9.30 tomorrow, you can find the YouTube, it's a YouTube video post it, uh, where you can watch Eric and me and uh, Z Garcia talk about our thoughts on Essen and ask questions live there. Or if you don't get to be there, it will be saved and you'll be able to watch it later. Um, and there's all sorts of other cool things coming from the Dice Tower soon. Guys, I really appreciate you watching. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.